All right, what's going on, my brothers and sisters? This is your brother, Rasta G, a.k.a. Greg Ward, coming at you from the Common Law Rights Society. Uh, we're coming with part two, part two of uh, the reading from Carlton Weiss's uh, Concise Trustee Handbook. Uh, this is a guide to the administration of an express trust under the common law, functioning under the general law merchant. All right, so uh, this, is, this is what we'll be reading from. Um, if you guys are interested in getting a copy of this, uh, we will be offering a uh, limited amount of supply that we will be uh, printing out and we'll send out to you for a uh, nominal fee. But you can always get it online. Uh, we'll certainly be glad to post the PDF um, underneath in the comment section or in the description below. Uh, but nonetheless, it's for me, it's always an amazing and fantastic thing to uh, have a physical copy of a book. I enjoy reading online, but I hope, and I know that most of you guys probably enjoy physical copies of things. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, we're gonna move over to our share. I'm just gonna look at you guys in the eye and say much love. We're gonna learn some positive things today. We're gonna continue on our road down the, uh, learning about the uh, common law express trust under, um, sorry, the private express trust under the common law. All right, let's go ahead and share our screen. All right, let's see. All right, so uh, what's going on? Um, apologize, let's see what's happening. All right, there it is. All right, so um, so yeah, we we ended on uh, the last one on page eight, and so let's go back up a little bit to page seven, um, and let's see what we got going on here. All right, so once again, you guys, this is uh, Carlton Weiss, uh, concise trustee handbook. Uh, his his it's a guide to the administration of an express trust under the common law, functioning under the general law merchant. So the main things to uh, remember about this particular um, trust is this trust is a non-statutory trust. That is the major thing to uh, recognize and realize is this is a non-statutory trust. Why is that important, you guys? A non-statutory trust means that you're not asking permission from the government to exercise your common law right of contract. This is enormous because everything we deal with today, almost everything we deal with today in today's society is always coming out of the root of, um, of the government's statutory authorized entities. You don't want to necessarily be down under a statutorily authorized entity. You want to be able to enjoy creating things from what God created you to be. You're a free free will human being who has the right to contract with another private human being. And so that's the main thing. And not only that, um, your common law right of contract is the same root level of authority that the actual original several states of the United States of America were created with. The original state constitutions were private express trusts. So, uh, yeah, that's why Article 1, Section 10 of the Federal Constitution says that no state may impair the obligations of contract. Now, that has to be a private contract, and where we see the most a, a judicial litigation uh, on this topic is in the private express trust. So let's go ahead and see. What we, there you go, right there. See? Constitution of the United States of America, Article 1, Section 10. No state shall pass any law impairing the obligations of contracts. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, let's see. The term natural person, we'll go over here just to read this again. It says, the term natural person has been applied to express trusts by courts of equity because of its administration being carried, carried out by men acting as natural persons. Um, so the, the natural person is the actual express trust itself. And uh, it's you as a trustee have a further protection. Let's see if we can pull it up. Under this application, the trust's right of contract is, un, is, is, is alienable. All right, so what is that saying? Uh, under this application, the trust's right 
of contract is alienable, whereas its creator's natural right of contract obviously is not. So that's um, something to pay attention to. Um, the creator's natural right of contract is un in unalienable. Let's go down to number 25. Well, how do we get to up to page six? I thought we were on page eight. Um, maybe I'm on. Oh, so maybe we were only under page six before. All right, so let's see what they're saying. Okay, so under number 25, where they were just referring to, it says, man's right of contract is considered so fundamental that even under Roman law, in its system of domestic slavery, all men, citizen or not, with the exception of slaves, the only non-persons, retained this fundamental right, use gentium. Uh, it is understood to derive from a, from a man's creator and therefore is unalienable even with his own consent or waiver. So that's why you see it under the state constitution that you can't contract away uh, your, your rights, uh, these unalienable rights. Even your consent and waiver cannot contract this away. It says man's right of contract logically is held by him in trust to his creator as property which has been settled upon him and thus can never be contracted away because such would invalidate the original contract itself. I love it. Let me read that again, you guys. Man's right of contract. So your rights, your fundamental unalienable rights are held by you in trust to his creator as property, which has been settled upon him. So basically your creator is literally giving you the property rights, the right of contract, and he's giving it to you to be held in trust both for himself, the creator, as well as your brothers and sisters out there. So the beneficiaries are your God and your neighbors. But you're, you're holding these rights in trust. You can't contract this away, guys. This is your God-given, unalienable rights. I love it. That's, that, to me, is one of the mo my most favorite uh, logical steps in law is when you start to think about you as a man or a woman have been given rights that those rights given by god are property that property placed upon you is given to you in trust why because your life is not your own yes it's your own when it comes to other people and them not being able to infringe upon it but god gave you your life and that life that god gave you he placed upon you in trust to give back to him in, in its proper in its proper format. You're not able to go out and start killing. You don't take and abuse your life that you've been granted. You do good things with it. All right, let's, 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 I'm gonna stop being so preachy. I, I know sometimes I might sound preachy. All right, so let's see. So yeah, we've read uh, uh, all these things. It says logic follows that if a man plays no part in a society, then he has no personal attachment or obligation thereto. The trustee under, an under a declaration of an express trust are only persons in the private sense. So that's that's something to remember, you guys. The trustees under a declaration of an express trust are only persons, they only become persons in a private sense because he is only a person, meaning a man that has a, a role, once he has accepted the role offered to him by the settler. Excuse me. Private persons may also, excuse me, pursue constitutional protections as natural persons, citizens within the meaning of Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution, uh, and may thereby claim entitlement to all the privileges and immunities of the same. So we're not talking about Article 14, I'm sorry, we're not talking about uh, 14th Amendment privileges and immunities, that's huge. You guys, you as, as citizens, um, within the meaning of Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution is a different citizen. You understand? You are, you are coming in as natural men and women, natural persons, private persons, within the Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution, and may thereby claim entitlement to all the privileges and immunities of the same. You have to go see Paul versus Virginia, 75 U.S. 168. That's in 1868. So, Perfect timing. I mean, you can't get any more perfect timing. 1868 is the 14th Amendment. That is the settle, uh, the closure of the Civil War. With the closure of the Civil War and the 14th Amendment literally placed upon the 
the uh, natural common law citizens was the civil law. The civil war brought the civil law. The civil law brought the term um, person, but in the sense of the 14th Amendment person. So that's why we also say that all court cases today are in fact civil. That is the reason, you guys, because anything that's deriving out of this law of persons, the person is the thing. Even though it says, even though in today's economic situation, the term citizen is presumed to signify the 14th Amendment citizen, the term cannot be applied to express trusts when administered properly. Uh, so I would suggest, you guys, that you consider that you create a private express trust simply for this reason alone. You could have four, four or five private express trusts, but for this particular purpose alone, create one that's non -penetrate, that, that cannot be penetrated. Create one that is so simple that you're not going to screw it up. So when he says, uh, when applied to express trust when administered properly, that means that you don't screw it up. You don't mix, you don't get minimum contacts to screw up your express trusts. We'll learn about that later, but have several trusts maybe, you guys. Consider that. You want to have one trust that's so simple, it might literally be, um, as an example, I might, I might take this video right now, and that this video being property, uh, or, or a, maybe a poem that I wrote, or a song that I wrote, um, something the simplest piece of property that you know you own, you're going to create that and you're going to say, I'm going to create a trust using this property for the benefits of the beneficiaries named here within. And I'm not going to mix this trust up with um, corporate authorities, with, with uh, bank accounts, with um, whatever different things that are utilizing this 14th Amendment citizen. You're not going to do any of this. You're not going to mix this up in this particular trust. You're going to use this particular trust to be the trustee that cannot be trampled upon. You understand what I'm saying? Let me read this again. Where it says, even though in today's economic situation, the term citizen is presumed to signify the 14th Amendment citizen, the term cannot be applied to express trusts when administered properly. In contrast, corporations as artificial persons are citizens of the United States within the meaning of the 14th Amendment per Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad County. Yes. So the 14th Amendment encompasses all of these things. All right, artificial persons, but under uh, Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution, that's where you guys are going to be coming in as trustees of the, your uh, private express trust and enforced by Paul versus Virginia, or at least to be shown right there. So, and the other, uh, the other trust, I'm sorry, the other case I was talking about in the last video was uh, Citizens United. So that's the next place where you're going to see 14th Amendment showing this BS jurisdiction, this, this subpar jurisdiction. It might have granted and raised up the corporations to be a higher, right, a higher status, but it certainly is not um, going to bring you guys as a higher status, the 14th Amendment. Amendment. You might get your civil rights, right? You might get civil rights through the 14th Amendment. We don't want civil rights. We want natural rights by God. See? See what I'm saying? Okay. Let's continue on. Um, all right, so if you look down here, it says, uh, let's see, we'll go up for a second. Let's see what it says. Da, 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 da. All right, so talking about, um, all right, so we looked at number 25 already. It says the express trust possesses the ability to hold or own property, engage in business transactions if they want to, and incur liabilities, including tax liabilities, if you want to. Only if you get involved in those things that would require you to have tax liabilities. Remember, that's only going to come from uh, corporate stocks and franchises, all right, as well as assumed creditorship, including secured party status. So he's saying that you could, your, your express trust could, could create a secured party status, all right? You could become a secured party through your express trust. All right, I'm gonna, let's go on. It says the corpus is the body of the trust. So... 
you can call it res, you can call it corpus, you can call it uh, the principal, but this res is the body of the trust, the property being held in trust for the beneficiaries, the very subject matter of the declaration. I'm going to take this little piece of gold and I'm going to place it into trust for my beneficiaries. I'm not going to assume any minimum contacts, and so therefore the subject matter of the declaration of my trust is this piece of gold or is this subject matter, this uh, body of the trust to be distributed or to be invested for the beneficiaries. You don't have to spend the trust property. You can invest it. You can protect it. It could be this video right here. It could be my uh, obligation of the trust is to take this video and spread it far and wide, to go and to speak uh, in every one of the 50 states of the union. Uh, it could be my obligation of this trust to go and speak before you guys, my beneficiaries, I can name every single one of you guys who watched this. Uh, in fact, let's do that. Let's, let's create a, a very simple uh, private express trust right now. All of you guys who are watching this uh, video, you will all be the beneficiaries of this trust. And we'll, we'll call this video right here, the declaration, I'm sorry, the, the body of the trust. And we'll make it real simple. It is my obligation to uh, do everything I can in my power that I find is necessary and proper, which could be anything, as long as I don't hurt anybody, then anything I deem is necessary and proper to, uh, to effectuate this trust, it's my obligation to go all across the world to everyone who's seen this video and do my best to come there in person, or I'm sorry, in my physical body if I can, uh, and, and explain this in further detail, okay? Uh, it is my obligation to you guys, the beneficiaries, to do everything I can to utilize this trust uh, to go across the world and show up in any of the 50 states of the union without any authorization outside of this declaration of this trust. Uh, I don't need any driver's license. I don't need anything to come to you guys, the beneficiaries, and, ex and, 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 and be able to present this subject matter. This, this education, education, this, this, this education can be the subject matter, the body of this trust. See what I'm saying, you guys? It could be anything. That's why when you get into it, you'll find that a trust can be molded into whatever shape you want it to be. Okay, let me go on, you guys. It should be noted that virtually anything, uh, see, there you go. I didn't even know that was coming next. It should be noted that virtually anything, that, that thing is the res, we'll see it down below, may be held in trust. However, there are certain things which, given their innate traits recognized in law, make for better subject matter, so to speak. Uh, and what he means by that is uh, he'll, he'll, he'll show you that gold, as an example, what they call portable land. Gold is called portable land because it comes from the land, and we're taking this gold and we're placing it. It's not God. Uh, God created this gold. The, uh, the governments didn't create this gold, but it's recognized as portable land. So we create this private express trust. We place this little piece of gold in the center of it and call it the res, the, the, uh, the body of the trust, the thing, if you will. Remember, things are in rem jurisdiction. They're res. But you can't, but the courts will never gain in rem jurisdiction over your trust if you don't have minimum contacts that are causing you to get involved in their jurisdiction. Let's continue. Um, initially, the legal minds who perfected the express trust in America did so to accommodate for the great obstacles in, pro in procuring special charters for corporations intended to deal in real estate, which trusts eventually came to be known as the Massachusetts Land Trusts. It was when those individuals came to realize the immense benefits of employing the trust for the purpose of holding land that they eventually expanded their utility, the express trust utility, to include the holding of personal property. So eventually, first it was real estate, and then it became, a, I'm sorry, first it was for holding land, and then it became expanded to include holding a personal property, because it was a found that the, that the courts upheld these trusts so well that personal property were placed into it, and they became um, known as the Massachusetts Electric Companies, because that was then eventually created um, out of trusts. It's unbelievable when you start to read uh, the history of these things. And of course, they want to do away with these trusts in the, in the public's knowledge as soon as possible because the amount of freedoms that were involved with these trusts that they were, that were being found, these, these trustees could go from state to state and not be held down by the statutory uh, regulations of each state. Literally, your express trust was your guiding force and your authority to go from state to state 
of the union and not be held down by these corporate statutory laws. For real, let's continue. As an aside, when considering the presently hostile official attitude toward non-statutory trusts, what is interesting to note is that much of the express trust's perfection is attributed to, it, to Attorney General and later United States Secretary of State Richard Olney. And uh, apologize. This is a. Uh, this is what number twenty-seven is referring to, uh, as far as a. Uh, so he says, see John H. Sears' Declaration of Trust as express. Um, I'm sorry, as effective substitutions for incorporation. It says only served as Attorney General from 1893 to 1895. The U.S. Secretary of State in 1895 to 1897, and prior to that in the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 1874. So remember, the Massachusetts Land Trust or the Massachusetts Business Trust were the first uh, examples. And uh, the Attorney General, the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, only um, he, Richard Olney, was uh, responsible for helping to perfect it. So it's he... Uh, Carlton Weiss is saying it's kind of funny when considering the presently hostile ad attitude towards the non-statutory trust that it was actually the uh, <laughs> the Attorney General and later United States Secretary of State Richard Olney that helped perfect it. All right, let's con let's continue. He says, but the uh, fact that the express trusts were initially primarily utilized for purposes of holding and handling real estate is very significant, especially to our present situation says the significance derives in pertinent part from the integral relationship between the law and the land, right? So what do they call the constitution, the law of the land, as opposed to maritime and admiralty, which is the law of the sea. All right, so it is, it is a fundamental principle of law that the land and the law go hand in hand. And in America, without the 14th Amendment, the law of the land is the constitution with its common law principles and its substance of gold and silver. Referred to in this sense, uh, precious metals are regarded in law as portable land. All right, let me uh, go ahead and make sure. I'm going to stop sharing for one half a second. I want to make sure that you guys are getting check, check, one, two. All right, I just want to make sure that uh, we were getting everything. All right. All right, so let's continue on. Um, and its substance of gold and silver. All right, so let's see. It is a fundamental principle of law that the land and the law go hand in hand. And, and in America, without the 14th Amendment, the law of the land is the Constitution with its common law principles. So if we could find ourselves back to that, then we'll go beyond the 14th Amendment, right? That's where we want to go. You want to get back to the root. You don't want to find yourself going further and further into these guys, these, uh, these, these legislators, world you want to find yourself back to the root of things all right so let's see the basic principle all right where are we um the law of the land is the constitution with its common law principles and its substance of gold and silver referred to in this sense precious metals are regarded in law as portable land the basic principle of law holds that land includes everything of value extracted from it. And without getting too deep into the operation of common law, see, we're always talking about operations of law. So it, this causes this to happen. It is this principle regarding the relationship of law, um, land and law, sorry, which by its operation threw up an obstacle to corporate real estate ownership. I love it. In order to charter a statutory civil law, entity to handle the substance of the common law, land, comma, special, if not extraordinary, legal circumstances must exist. Let me read that again, you guys. Where are we? Where are we? All right, let's go up right here. It is this principle regarding the relationship of land and law, which by its operation threw up an obstacle to corporate real estate ownership. All right, let me read right here. In order to charter a statutory entity, 
read it, let me read it again. In order to charter a statutory, meaning a legislated civil law entity to handle the substance of the common law, which is land, special, if not extraordinary legal circumstances must exist. What are those special circumstances, Carlton? He says, these circumstances did not exist prior to the post-Erie federal common law. What? These circumstances did not exist before Erie federal common law, the post-Erie federal common law, whose imposition was made possible by loss of the gold standard, the substance of the law in 1933. You guys, there's so many things happening in this one circumstance of what he's talking about. What, what happened? Yet 1913, the Federal Reserve was put in place, okay? 1913, the Federal Reserve was put in place. Fantastic, whatever they, you might say. What does that have to do with anything, Greg? Well, first and foremost, let me, let me refer you back to Jefferson's quotation. If the, if, the, if the American people ever allowed private uh, entities, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase them. If the American people ever allowed the issuance of currency to fall into the hands of private entities, then these banks and the corporations that, that rise up around it will eventually, through inflation and deflation, deprive the people of the land that their forefathers conquered. Okay, so what happened, you guys? 1913, Federal Reserve uh, took over the issuance of currency. Private banks, calling themselves federal, but they were not federal. They had no reserve, and they called themselves Federal Reserve. They said, as through the, when the Congress was debating it, and the Congress said, well, the American people are used to getting gold uh, for their dollar bills, the Federal Reserve uh, Board said, and again, I'm paraphrasing, correct me if I'm wrong as far as who said this, but there, it was said by the Federal Reserve Board, no problem, no problem. We will still allow the American people to get gold for their, uh, for their dollar bills. Well, that was just a BS. That was just BS for 20 years because what happened was 1913, they said that. And they continued to, uh, they trade out, um, instead of American issued dollar bills, they were, for, they were Federal Reserve dollar bills, Federal Reserve notes. And uh, it, the Federal Reserve was given a 20 year charter. Now, between 1913 and 1933, during this 20 year charter, America went to war in World War I. They issued so many bonds to fund this war that was to be paid back in gold. And don't think that this for one second that this war was not contrived by the same people that caused this Federal Reserve to take place. You don't believe me? That's fine. But I'm going to tell you that it seems way too obvious. All right. 1913 to 1933. So many bonds were issued to, to fund the government and its war efforts that they could not pay back in gold. So what happened? 1933, FDR came into uh, presidency, and the very first day, he issued the Emergency Banking uh, Act of 1933. He closed the banks for a banking holiday, and he removed the ability for the American people to demand gold for their payments of their debts and their contracts. What was given in replace of that was the legal tender, right, fiat. The legal tender of the Federal Reserve note would now be legal tender for public and private debts. So no longer could you get the substance of the gold, the land, for your debts, but now you had a floating currency backed by nothing. All right, so because of this floating currency, it was literally a, 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 a money, based simply upon contract law outside of your authority. So when you start using third party, right? Federal Reserve notes, which means that there's still a debt owed at the end of the contract. So I pay you 20 Federal Reserve notes for a bushel of apples. You, get, you give me the bushel of apples, you get the Federal Reserve notes, but that Federal Reserve note is still required to be paid back. It's a note. It's a debt note. So there's no longer two-party contracts. You enter in a, 30, a third party into the, into the contract. 
the Federal Reserve and the international bankers. Okay, so when that happened, you removed, all right, you removed the law from the land and you put it into a floating layer that's, that, that, that literally floated above the land in the world of contract law. And it was then furthermore uh, cemented when the, uh, the Erie Railroad case came through and, um, and the Supreme Court said that there is uh, no federal common law, right? Everything is based in contract. And uh, let's continue on. I don't wanna, I don't wanna misspeak, but let's, let's see if Carlton can explain it in a better way. But that's literally what happened, you guys. You had a change of jurisdiction across the United States. <laughs> literally a change in jurisdiction across the United States, you guys. It was unbelievable. First, you had the 14th Amendment in 1868. You had the Federal Reserve in 1913. 20 years later, 1933, the gold was removed from the dollar. And you had a new jurisdiction that was born. And it all came hand in hand. Let's continue. Let's, let's see what Carlton has to say. My apologies for anything that I'm speaking incorrectly attributed to I. Anything that is correct attributed to the law and to history because this stuff is serious, you guys. And uh, again, forgive me. This is, you know, I mean, we have barely gotten any anywhere in, the, in this in this last uh, little while that I've been recording this. But you guys got to understand this stuff is is so important upon your knowledge of what's happening today. Stuff was happening goes back to 1868, 1913, 1933, and they wonder why people of today in, in, in 2019 don't know what the heck's going on. All right, so let's continue. Sorry, once again, <laughs> I love it, you guys. This is I I, I live for you guys understanding this, this stuff. It says, these circumstances did not exist prior to the post-Erie federal common law. And, and, he, and he goes down to the 29th uh, uh, footnote. So you wanna see Lee Brops, the law, the money, and your choice. Um, and here's, here's the, uh, well, you guys can look it up. Just look up Lee Brops, the law, the money, and your choice. You're gonna read some incredible things with what we're talking about right now. It says, um, Sorry, you guys. Uh, where are we? All right. All right. So we're in number twenty. Uh, the, these circumstances. These circumstances did not exist prior to the post-Erie federal common law, whose imposition was made possible by loss of the gold standard, the substance of the law, in 1933. A statutory entity is inherently accountable to courts of civil legislative jurisdiction. Let me read it again. A statutory entity is inherently, has to be, because it's created by the legislature. So it's inherently accountable to courts of civil, that means dealing with persons, which a, st a statutory entity is, according to the, uh, you know, Santa Clara County, all right? Deriving subject matter jurisdiction from the corporate charter over which the legislature holds the in rem jurisdiction as well by way of possession of the charter documents themselves. They created the charter documents, so therefore they hold the in rem jurisdiction. All right, you got it? Whereas an express trust is obviously inherently accountable to courts of common law and equity, deriving subject matter jurisdiction from the trust instrument and the corpus alone. As logic follows, in rem jurisdiction remains with the trustee at all times, unless the trust instrument and corpus are surrendered to a third party voluntarily. In rem jurisdiction, i.e. actual possession is the key. Let me read it again. In rem jurisdiction, actual possession is the key. Uh, and as Carlton points out in his other uh, article we read in our last, our other, our other video, that possession is nine tenths of the law. That one tenth where it's not is exactly this right here, you guys. As a trustee, you are in that one tenth, right? You are that one tenth. So possession uh, is nine tenths of the law. Uh, that one tenth is where you get to be able to be, as uh, um, Rockefeller said, own nothing, control everything. That's the one tenth. That's the trustee. That's where you guys want to be. All right, let me read this whole sentence again. Whereas an express trust is obviously inherently accountable to courts of common law and equity only, deriving subject matter jurisdiction from the trust indenture 
and corpus. All right, let's go down to number 31 and see what uh, he's talking about, where is he referring to. It should be noted that through, that though the express trust is created under common law, it is not a creature of the common law as distinguished from equity, but rather it is created under a common law of contracts and not dependent upon any statutes. Equity supplements the common law. See generally Schumann, Hank versus Folsom, 328, uh, 321, and says, and though the trust may bring an action in admiralty, it is not inherently accountable to that jurisdiction. Okay? You guys seeing it? Let me read it again. It should be noted that though the express trust is created, is created under common law, it is not a creature of the common law as distinguished from equity, okay? But rather, it is created under the common law of contracts and not dependent upon any statutes. Equity su supplements the common law. And, and, and although he doesn't say it in this particular one, equity compels performance. Equity would, will uphold your trust, okay? Okay. Gosh. Let's go back up. Whew. Getting tired already, you guys. I'm going to have to stop this video here shortly just to catch my breath, and uh, we'll have to make a third one. All right. As logic follows, in rem jurisdiction remains with, with the trustee at all times unless the trust instrument and corpus are surrendered to a third party voluntarily, which is why I said you guys create a trust for your living, for you to operate out of. Very simple one. You can make a second one. You can make a third one with property in it that you don't want to, you know what I mean, get involved with this and that. But you can make a very simple one to live out of, okay? In rem jurisdiction, i.e. actual possession, is the key. So you want to have the in rem jurisdiction over your trust, not give it to the courts. All right. This brings us to today. In the jurisdiction of the 14th Amendment, United States Public Trust, precious metal, the substance of the common law is legally merely a commodity. Let me read that again. In the jurisdiction of the 14th Amendment United States Public Trust, precious metal, the substance of the common law, so you have two different jurisdictions, the 14th Amendment United States Public Trust, and then you have the common law. In the jurisdiction of the 14th Amendment United States Public Trust, Precious metal, gold and silver, which is the substance of the common law, under the 14th Amendment is legally merely a commodity. Excuse me. Back in the Republic, however, it remains the staple for payment of debts. What? Back in the Republic? Ah, so what, are we not in the Republic? No, you're not. You're in the public trust democracy. All right, so back in the Republic, however, it remains the staple for payment of debts. He goes and he says, check out number 32. Let's go down here and see what he's talking about. He says, see the Constitution for the United States of America, Article 1, Section 10, no state, right, may make anything but gold and silver a payment in debt. Okay, let's go back up here again. Oh, man. Back in the Republic, however, it remains the staple for payment of debts. No, no state may, may make anything else a payment in debt other than gold and silver. Back in the Republic, however, it remains the staple for payment of debts. Though, the sur though surface gold and silver are in considerably less quantity and without a fixed standard upon which to be traded. You don't have to have a lot of gold or silver to be uh, the, the corpus of your trust. The express trust under the common law holding real estate, silver or gold, is holding the very substance of the law under which it was created, thus ensuring that bond between law and land and the powers and guarantees that come with it. Which ones, which powers and guarantees? Let's go to number 33. And he says, see the Bill of Rights, Seventh Amendment, 1791. Okay, all right. Let's go ahead and push pause for a second. All right, let's see.
All right. So we're going to push pause and we're going to come back for our third video. Um, much love to you guys. We'll talk to you soon.